Hi everyone, I'm Krina Okumos. I'm one of the initiators of Omnes.live and this is the Omnes Live podcast. The Omnes Live podcast, it's a non-profit project and I would like to thank to everyone who helped me to make this project happen. This is an interview series with known personalities from all over the world. By exploring questions about life and learning how these people deal with pain, as we are all doing, pressure and challenges in their private life and professional lives, I really hope you take a nugget of wisdom or two and you are improving your own life for the better. I invite you to join us in our daily meditation sessions at omnes.live. As for the Omnes Live podcast, I really hope you will find some of the answers you are seeking. Today on the podcast, I'm speaking with Sebastian Siegel, American-British actor, director, author, and integral artist. Sebastian adapted the screenplay, directed and produced the feature film Grace and Greed, which by the way guys, you really have to go and see it. It's based on the Ken Wilber's acclaimed book. Marion Williamson said about Sebastian Siegel that he draws insights into the beauty and complexities of the human condition with an inspiring and original voice. I really can't wait for you to hear how Sebastian has pivoted his career in such a meaningful way and how he's making a difference in this world. Now, on the Omnes Life podcast is Sebastian Siegel. Sebastian, I'm so honored having you as the first guest of our podcast and thank you so much for having time for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the first question, probably you are not expecting that, but due to the fact that you are a director, an author, an integral artist, which I really love that title, um, and being my first podcast, how you manage emotions in a, on a live? Because of course, it's not about the author and the director, but as, as, a, as an actor, how can you deal with emotions when you are in a moment like that, in a live, or maybe in, in a situation that you don't know how to deal with, how you, how you are doing that? Mm-hmm. That's a beautiful question. And it, listen, it's, uh, first off, it's a pleasure to be here, here with you. And uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, thanks for all the work that you're doing in the world, too, with, and the way that you're using also meditation as an invite and a platform for people to be able to embody themselves more and then to be able to ultimately show up in the world more as more of themselves, which I really think is ultimately the practice of a healthy meditation uh, practice. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I think, Likewise. You know, I think so much um, you know, powerful emotions are the mechanisms that allow us to do so many things that we would not otherwise do. Yeah? And uh, sometimes mm-hmm. it's very easy, those emotions that draw us together, attraction, love, and you know, the things that inspire, you know, inspiration, where we might help someone uh, that we wouldn't normally otherwise think of doing because we feel something strongly, mm-hmm. right? Or we might care for someone, or we might sacrifice our own lives you know, a, a day or a week or even years to care mm-hmm. for someone because we feel something. Um, or inspiration throughout history, you know, the inspiration to climb a mountain or venture across an ocean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that emotion is so powerful. Um, you know, or sometimes now then leaning into sort of the heavier, more intense, transcendent senses of, of where emotion and, and thought correlate is sometimes we're called to do something. Yeah, that's beyond just a feeling. In other words, maybe like Martin Luther King or like Mahatma Gandhi or on any level, whether it's negative or positive, we're called to do something that we don't necessarily want to do. Yeah, like Gandhi, you know, he was uh, an attorney and this is the life that he was living, but he felt rejected by his own people in in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. He was called deep down inside to do this thing. 
Yeah, and so I think so many ways emotions are so powerful. Sometimes at the top end, let's say even in the, in the Gandhi circumstance or in the Martin Luther King circumstance where you would say to someone ahead of time, mm-hmm. you're gonna be attacked, you're gonna be defamed, you're gonna be alone, you're going to be brutalized, you're gonna be in pain, but it's gonna be really important. Do you wanna do it? You know, and you'd say, no way, right? <laughs> or for example, in terms of adventure, if I said to you, I'm going to take you this week and you're, you're going to risk frostbite. You're going to risk death. You're going to eat horrible food for two months. You're going to have trouble breathing. You're going to be freezing. You might lose limbs and you got a decent shot of dying. You know, do you want to go with me? But it's going to be really fulfilling and satisfying. You'd say, no way. I'll go the other way. But if I reframed it and I said to you, we're going to climb Mount Everest and it may kill you and it may be brutal and it may be challenging. But if we get to the top, you will have transformed yourself through your own risk yeah, to live more and to risk your own life. So in that, in that way, I think that your question about managing emotions is ultimately in the most meditative practical sense, a Tai Chi exercise of letting go to hold on, of allowing them in. In other words, if the emotion is joy and love and the sense of adventure but anxiety and fear, to let it in and say, what am I really afraid of? Is it pain that I'm afraid of? Okay, why? What's the circumstance here? Should I step back and not climb Mount Everest? Or should I step back and not launch into this new thing that speaks to me, this cause? Or is this cause more important than me? In other words, is who I am enough or do I need to climb Mount Everest? You know, is there something inside of me that needs to be woken, that needs to be challenged? Or is my life perhaps not as important as this cause for a people, for an ideal, for uh, the dedication to a human being to care for a human being? So for me, on a personal level, even on the macro emotions, the micro emotions, I think more pertinent to your question about feeling anger or disappointment mm-hmm. or sorrow, when it comes down to those things, which I think really is where the question comes from, is to allow them in and to say, well, if I feel sad and if I feel sorry, it's okay. Maybe the sorrow is a reflection of all the joy that came before. In other words, if I have to let go of a relationship, maybe that pain is a celebration of what came before. If, I, if someone passes in my life, someone who I'm dear to, how do I manage that emotion? I don't. I just witness it. In other words, the emotion's here and I'm melded in it. I take the emotion and put it here so that I can experience it, but I'm also aware of it. Yeah. And if that emotion is sadness and sorrow, then I celebrate that as the winter that comes before the spring. Yeah. So beautiful. I am actually into, um, I lost my father five, uh, five, six years ago. And at the beginning, I really realized that it's like I hate everything around. But now I realize this it was the most beautiful thing that was really happening in my life. So I completely understand this part. You mentioned climbing on the Everest, but how do we really know what is the correct Everest for, for us? Because sometimes we need to climb some, some, some mountains, but maybe they are not the right ones for us. When we can somehow, when do you see that is the right mountain to climb? And when you can just say, actually, this is not mine. I should just... <laughs> Let it go to some, for someone else. That's a great question. And that, I think, is where the integral framework really, really comes into being. Because so, t- so often it's hard to differentiate between, let's say, fear and justification, right? Or desire, procrastination. W- w- how do we differentiate between those things, right? What is that Everest? And I think that's when a meditative practice can be very healthy and very helpful, in the way that if we're able to go inside and I think about what is transcendence mean, right? To preface, it means going beyond, right? Going beyond the body, going beyond the thoughts, going beyond the feelings. In other words, stepping into a space that is beyond the self, right? So just in a very simple way, just to preface with transcendence on a physical realm, when we fall asleep at night, we have this sense of me, I falling asleep and yet the sheets disappear and the room disappears And then all of a sudden we're walking in a field or we're floating in the sky or we're in some other place, but we still have a sense of I, 
right? Mm -hmm. So already there's been some transcendent thing that's occurred from gross to subtle, or from waking to dreaming, or from beta, alpha, theta, right? Mm -hmm. There's a subtle sense of transcendence of, of going beyond. So when we say, is this Mount Everest for me? I think part of that evaluating that when it's really a crisis is to step back and evaluate all these thoughts and feelings and say, what's in me that's driving me so strongly? And how do I know whether to honor it or not? For instance, let's say someone is ill in my life, my lover, my friend, or my family, this person, my family, and, and in order to have no one, in order to take care of them, I'm going to need to take care of them for the next five years of my life. I'm going to have to give up everything I'm doing, let's say. Let's say hypothetically, in order to care for this person. How do we know what's right? Is it more important to care for the person? Or is it more important to do this thing in my life that I feel called to do these other things? At that juncture, we can't determine oftentimes with our eyes open. Sometimes we can only determine with our eyes closed because there will be a pain of not caring for this person, but there will also be a pain of not honoring, let's say, this other thing. The beautiful part of the story is that when we close our eyes, we really feel, in other words, deep down inside, what is the impulse that is drawing me? In other words, that's that wisdom of God. That's that wisdom of divine electrical current. That's that wisdom that tells us what to do. It's the same wisdom that the bee knows which flower to pollinate, right? It doesn't make a decision on oh, this flower, this flower. You know, it just goes, it just knows, right? And that's the essence of a contemplative practice, of a Zen practice. So in short, how do we know? We have to close our eyes, we have to be still, and we have to feel through it. Also, the only healthy way to go about that process is to know that on the, on the heavy side, it will be challenging. If I care for this person, I'm going to have regret. I'm going to have pain and going to have a sense that I didn't engage in this other thing that's important to me. If I do this thing, I may have regret. I may have sorrow. I may, have, I may feel that I've done the wrong thing. But when we close our eyes, we'll know this is more important right now in my life. I'm in service to this in a greater way than I'm in service to this. Or I'm in service to this in a greater way than I'm in service to this. And I love the question because it dovetails right back into the question about Gandhi or Martin Luther King, let's say, mm -hmm. that Martin Luther King, an amazing man, husband, friend, love, father, etc. But before all of those things, he had a higher calling mm -hmm. that had to hierarchically peripheralize those things in some way. And how amazing to know him or to love him or to be related to him, but also how challenging because his cause was so great. But ultimately, the people in his life eventually understood, or maybe instantaneously understood, his cause is so great. And just by being with him, I am part of that cause. Yeah. So in short, the answer is we have to close our eyes and we have to trust. The beautiful thing about love and the dynamic energy of divinity is that sometimes the two, let's say, the, the, the sacrifices and the things that we think are the Everest for us, sometimes they're intertwined. In other words, sometimes I say, well, it's more important I care for this person. And then I end up on the top of Everest. Or sometimes I go to climb Everest and I end up in doing that, soothing this person. In other words, that's the great it. paradox of life. And then we can only engage it when we let go to hold on. Right? I mean, definitely everything sounds very, very easy. But I'm sure that some of our followers, they will say, okay, let go, let go. But all the time we have our mind who is coming all the time. And somehow it's somehow for some people, even in my case, sometimes I really, uh, I already call my, my ego or my mind, I call it Jetta. And I try to realize this is part of me, but it's actually just my ego or it's just my mind. My question is, how can we try to make our mind silent and to really go into our, our heart. Yeah, to have this silence to get our answer. What, what will be like a simple advice for someone that they are really at the beginning of, uh, of doing these exercises? Yes, that's a great question. Thank you for that. I think um, I want to preface it. I want to answer it simply, but I, I also want to preface it right, by saying that it is really letting go 
to hold on. Uh, I think that the requisites are courage. Yeah, and sometimes the things that prompt that courage are, are pain or discomfort, right? In other words, sometimes we are drawn when we're inside the womb to leave the womb, yeah, to be born in some way. And sometimes it's very, we know, right? Other times it's very tough. We have to be afraid in order to drive forward, right? We have to feel like, oh my God, I need to leave this country or this thing in my life or this relationship or this addiction or this process in order to go forward. We, we, we get to the point where we just can't take it anymore, right? I think that with, in terms of silencing the mind, in a lot of ways, it's the same thing about just witnessing thoughts, saying that I have thoughts, but I'm not my thoughts. I'm right here and I'm thinking, oh my God, what's going on in the world? All this horrible stuff, right? Or all this wonderful stuff. I look around and I say, oh my God, what am I feeling? I feel this sense of angst. And then it's to say, okay, I feel these things. Mm -hmm. And I think these things, but there's a me witnessing behind those things. And I can be aware that I have thoughts, but who I am is not my thoughts. I have emotions. But who I am is not these emotions. The emotions pass through me. The thoughts pass through me. And this is quintessential Ramana Maharshi, who's a big influence on me, you know, and this, in, in terms of this essential meditative practice, right? When we go into a meditative practice, the breath is so important because the best in-breath happens after the out-breath, right? Mm -hmm. And the deeper the out-breath, the better the in-breath. And the more easy the in-breath, the deeper the out-breath, right? And so the same thing with the thoughts and emotions. That that's ultimately a metaphor for that, right? That if we can let the thoughts in, then we can just let them out. And say, oh my God, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. Okay, well, okay, I'm afraid. Well, so what? Right? In other words, okay. Yeah, in other words, I'm afraid. What is it that I'm afraid of? Right? Ultimately, the answer to that it's this little me in this life that I'm afraid of conserving. I don't want to hurt this little me, you know, this me. But all these things I want to do, whether it's love or work or write or share or grow or plant or mother or, or friend or whatever that thing is, all those things are the bigger me. Those processes, in other words, have been going on for millions of years, billions of years, right? And I'm just engaging in those activities in those modalities of being through this little me so this little me is important in some way but only if it's in service to this greater process right so to silence the mind don't try to silence the mind do the opposite let it be as noisy as possible <laughs> and then just sit in the noise okay. the last i know i just want to put one button on that not to extrapolate for too long but for example, when we sit down at the beach and we hear the waves, right when we arrive at the beach, we hear the waves. And then once we sit there long enough, we no longer hear them. We just, they're just an aspect of us. We're an aspect of that. You and I have a conversation, the waves no longer, until you say, or I say, listen to the waves. And then we say, oh my God. Mm -hmm. I'd almost forgotten. And it's the same thing with the traffic. It's the same thing with the birds. It's the same thing with, and that's the essence, essence of a meditative practice, right? That we drop in and not by not trying to deny the world, we allow the world in, we become the world. I love it. Thank you. I love it. So simple at the end, right? Breathing. I mean, it's so simple. Um, it's simple in the way that it's fundamental, fundamental but it takes... Yeah sometimes a million years to get there. And I think that's, you know, ultimately Zen is so important because sometimes it's right there in an instant mm -hmm. and sometimes it's three or 30 years away. So beautiful. And that's awakening, right? That's, that's what that is. And Alan Watts writes a lot about that. It's also been a great impact on you know, me that sometimes, you know, Zen Satori is three seconds and sometimes it's 30 years. And that's the truth of the thing. But it doesn't really you mentioned matter. you mentioned about the uh, awakening awakening word, and I want to ask you what is the meaning of life for you. 
Romania, and yeah. I just want to, um, um, if you if you let a few seconds, I want to recommend everyone to to watch uh, one of your documentary, Awakening World, which was it, it's it's an amazing, beautiful uh, documentary about that. And um, I'm curious, what is your meaning in life? Meaning is something that we don't come here already pre-programmed with. Yeah, meaning is something we create. Yeah. In other words, we, we, you know, meaning, meaning is uh, an afterthought, right? Meaning is a symptom of existing. Yeah. We engage in some dance, yeah? and we dance to the music. And the mission in making a dance beautiful and it feeling good is letting go. Mm -hmm. Stepping aside and letting the music run through us so that we dance. Because the meaning of a dance cannot be to get to the end. Because why not just step into the end? <laughs> and then there's no dance, right? <laughs> in other words, the same thing with the song. If a song is a minute or three minutes or you know, 10 hours long, however long the song is, a piece of music, the mission is not to get to the end. The mission is the space in between the beats. And it's that rhythm, that space. So when I start to think about meaning, I start to think, okay, there's something dangerous happening here. There's a trap I'm falling into by trying to reduce life into a theorem, into an equation, into a mathematical output into a diagram, into a map, right? And maps are wonderful to help us get from here to there, from there to here, from here to here, here up, right? It's wonderful processes, but ultimately, in the end, in the end, 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 again and again and again, the processes is all that matter. So I think with meaning, I think the ultimate meaning is just the proliferation and extrapolation of beauty, you know, of magnificence. Yeah. And, and I want to put a button on that, a bow on that by saying that ultimately, let's say there's non-duality, there's nothing like before the big bang, before all bangs, before there's just non-duality, there's non-dual suchness. And then we come into the world, right? The only reason to come into duality is to have recognition. It's for God to be able to see itself. It's for spirit to be able to see itself, right? In other words, I could sit here alone and have this conversation with myself or you with yourself or anyone at home. But by this engagement, all of a sudden, we're all connected here in this process. Whoever's engaging in this right now is engaging in this some sort of intimate connection with self or with you or with me or with other or with the individual they're with or just with being, yeah? And that's the meaning. We believe a lot in this, in the power of connectedness and togetherness. Actually, this is the reason that we start Omnes. So, and it's unbelievable to really have this experience with some, um, a, like two people or even a big group. And I'm sure that you had that. Um, I follow you in the, in the last period and I know that you are organizing um, amazing experience. I, I'm sorry, I missed the last one, but um, I, I really recommend uh, our followers to check your Instagram and um, you're organized. Hopefully very soon, you will be on Omnes. <laughs> and um, um, we can really um, experience this together here besides the interview with the power of togetherness. I really love the answer of uh, even the five-year-old little boy about the, the meaning of life. And it's so beautiful to just be so simple describe. Um, and I think it's, it's really beautiful. So I really recommend everyone to watch it. Um, you are doing so many things. And first of all, I don't know when you have time to do all this. So first of all, what is your secret of that? What is your secret? You are a director, you are an author, you are integral artist, um, actor. You are doing so many. I mean, probably one person can do one of these in their life and you are doing so many together. How you do this and 
What is your favorite out of it? If you had to choose one, if you will be in this situation to choose one, which one you will, it will be? Okay, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. You know, I think of all the, the, the things that I do are really all the same thing. Mm -hmm. And the way that they're all storytelling and they're all in consciousness, right? So the correlation between storytelling and film, books, and psychology and meditation, right? And then in film, there are different subsidiary characters, you know, or categories of writing, producing, directing, acting, but they're all storytelling. And so when I think about these three things, these aspects of storytelling, so storytelling being the one thing, I think about the way that I organize my life and the way that I show up in the world that everything is through this, this structure, yeah, or this, you know, this interest. In other words, I, I, at some point, yeah, I feel that in order to touch something in a particular way, it requires letting go of many other things, yeah. So for me, on the, just on the pragmatic level, I'm very, very, very focused. Yeah? I bring people into my life very slowly. I engage with media, with content, with people, with the world in a way that is, is, is very, very, very focused. In other words, I want to show up to serve as a storyteller in film, books, psychology, meditation, to the greatest capacity that I can. And that means not doing a lot of other things, right? So it's really about focus. And if I think about the most, the, the individuals who, let's say, inspire me on, on every on many levels or even people who don't inspire me but who are highly you know who are really doing spectacular things right whether it's you know the leader of, of of a country or whether it's a revolutionary or whether it's an artist you know like so in other words whether it's martin luther king or picasso you know or or someone to lead a country you know out of uh, mm -hmm. oppression uh, i think that all of those things require a relentless type of focus and engagement, yeah. And sometimes in the play and in the process, let's say bringing in a relationship, does bringing in this relationship, uh, if I feel it out in my life, whether it's friend, love, family, whatever thing, does engaging in that relationship ultimately serve that individual to be more of themselves? And does it ultimately also serve my capacity as a storyteller? In other words, my play and my freedom and my liberation. In other words, intimacy. Am I getting to know myself more deeply through you? And are you getting to know yourself more deeply through me? So the question is, even right now on this call, yes, right? In this process, I'm getting to, we're getting to touch life in a way just through the, through the extrapolation of, right? So that's one thing, focus, relentless focus, which means letting go of a lot of things sometimes. Games or parties or fun or books that say, okay, this isn't for me. This is maybe more challenging, but this is the one I need to go with, right? And then... Um, in terms of what's, what would be my favorite, I like this question very much because I think about, you know, I moved from... It's a tough one, no? I mean, probably uh, your passion by... Well, is it? Well, it, it, I, I think in one way, but I, I, have a, I, mean, I, I can articulate it you know, very clearly in the way to say that when I was a boy, uh, we were, I was, I'm from England. Yeah, my mother's yeah. side was from England all the way back, mm -hmm. you know? And my father's American and his heritage is, is Russian Jewish. Yeah. But we moved to Hawaii when I was a boy because he got a job teaching um, comparative religions and India was a specialty. Um, but to answer the question, both about religions and also about Hawaii, is that there are many Hawaiian islands that people have heard of, right? Molokai, Oahu, Hawaii, the Big Island, Maui, Lanai, etc. And when I was living there, people would say, well, what's your favorite island? Yeah. And I would say, well, you know, the Hawaiian island chain, the one that's the furthest south is the youngest, the big island. So it's the most mm -hmm. volcanic yeah, and barren. And the one that's the furthest north, let's say, that's known, you know, that people often go to is Kauai. And it's five million years old. And it's older, so it's more lush and more tropical. And the Hawaiian island chain goes up for 78 million years you know, the Aleutian chain of islands. And so the further north they are, the, 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 the more lush and then the, you know, fall into the ocean, mm -hmm. after crush themselves from their own weight. Um, but point being is that the, all the islands are very different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I love them all. 
for their differences and how I have to show up in each of those islands, uh, how I have to show up in this rough, barren space. And now I'm using this as a metaphor or how I have to show up in this lush, tropical, intense space. In other words, who am I when I show up in these spaces? Yeah. And can I come to know myself more deeply in this rough, barren space? And I can, can I come to know myself more deeply in this lush tropical space in different ways than I can in this barren space? Yeah. So to answer the question, which do I prefer more? It depends on the moment of how can I be of greater service and at which one operates as a function to my own becoming. In other words, which one do I get to know myself more thoroughly at the right moment with the right ingredients? And then I can make that simplify that uh, in, in a more in an even more relatable way to say let's suppose you have five children and with 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 one you play chess with one you go uh, fishing or you go hiking with one you you do music and dance with one you do art with one you just walk right mm -hmm. in other words all these children you don't love one more or less than the other but with each one you're of service in a different way, and so you inhabit yourself in a different way. You find your own becoming through each one of these children in a different way. So the same for me. It's all storytelling, so there's a continuity between all those things, and it's all very clear and focused. And in each one, depending on what, I'm, what the resources are around at the time and the opportunities to engage with others, with these other puzzles dynamically, is to say, okay, there's this tremendous opportunity for becoming as a storyteller and as a director right now in this particular process. So let me give myself fully to that. And then at another juncture, right, it might be, okay, there's this period of solitude that is, I'm being called to write, right? And so I must engage in that. Right? Now, because you mentioned that, I would like to go a little bit further to grace and greet. Yeah. Um, and um, at the beginning, I was very curious why you choose this story. Um, I, would, I would like to let you to, to tell to our uh, uh, listener um, why, uh, because it's a, beautiful, it's a beautiful story about it, if, if you can share it with us. Please, why you yeah. choose this, uh, this book, basically? Yeah, you know, that's a great question because it dovetails back into where we started mm -hmm. about calling that I read the book and I, it was gorgeous and spectacular and, and it moved me and shook me in, in many amazing ways. And I read all the author, Ken Wilber's books, or read most of his books uh, you know, over the course of, of many years. And I didn't choose it in so much as it chose me in the way that I was called to do something, to be in service to something that I feel is more significant and important than me, than this little me. I love the book. I, I, I love it. It's spectacular. And I adore it's, and love it's amazing. it. amazing. And I adore and I and love and admire the man and the, the, the writer of it. But then when I put myself aside, I feel that I, I have an ability, a capacity, perhaps a, a proclivity, a propensity that, in other words, a skill set that I offer an ingredient to be able to tell this story, and I must commit that ingredient within me to tell this story, just the right honey and just the right salt. In other words, that I feel like, ah, I have this special honey and salt that I can give to this, and I'm going to put myself aside to some degree in service to this thing. I love it. So that's how I came to tell the story, and it's an epic love story. Ultimately, it's about passionate, romantic, mm -hmm. selfless, courageous, right. and ultimately transcendent love. In other words, what are this story, Grace and Grit, this love story, this epic love story, right, is ultimately about what are the transformative capacities of love? How can love resurrect us? I love it. I love it. It's very beautiful and congratulations. Um, I know that um, you postponed a little bit the premieres, but you already had one uh, amazing prize uh, for it, right? Which is impressive. I mean, it's, um, 
um, it's impressive and I really can't wait to see it. I saw the trailer and I can't wait to see the movie and I really recommend everyone to watch it. It's uh, really, really catch me and I love the, the casting and everything. It's, it's amazing. Hey, thank you so much. This I, if you haven't seen the taser, you can look up graceandgrit.net is the website for the film, but also the film will be everywhere uh, at the end of the year. Uh, but you can look up Grace and Grit uh, Grace and Grit movie anywhere you know to look at the teaser, the trailer. Yeah. I want to go a little bit back for one question, and I promise will not take too long. Um, we have um, some people that they are kind of in in their time in their life where they can like we can call it second life, second chance, let's say, when they are not sure if they are on the right path or not. And um, we didn't touch the subject when you really actually went to your spiritual world. And I, for example, know that um, when you were uh, at the beginning of your um, actor career, you were had to, correct me if I'm wrong, you had to even choose between uh, becoming a psychologist or an actor, and then all your journey, how, how you discover that this is the right thing from the beginning, now I know that you feel it, but how, like, how can you advise someone? Like in my case, I'm, I did fashion for many, many years. And in one second, I realized this is not my calling. I had a, pro I had a, a very highly profitable business. Everything went well, but I felt really empty inside. And I choose to shut down everything and to, I choose freedom. But now I'm in this stage, where I try to figure out, okay, what's next? So what advices you are doing, especially because you had your moment in life when you had to choose about that? What are you advising me and our, our followers? I think that, I mean, in some ways, when you beautifully answer the question in asking it, yeah, in some way, I mean, you know, your commitment to leave this thing that you are skilled at um, fashion and to leave this for something else requires this courage and letting go, right? Like, yeah. But when you close your eyes, you feel I'm more in service to this thing. So I, the symptoms of doing something that aren't effective at that juncture show up, right? That we become uneasy with what we're doing. We become unsatisfied with what we're doing or not doing. We feel that we're not, something in ourselves isn't being poured into the space that we're occupying in a certain way that we need it to. We can feel that, right? In a relationship, right? I'm not fully growing in this relationship. Okay, is there something else I can do to be better, to, to give myself more, to find myself more in fashion, in this relationship? in whatever the thing is, in the engagement. Or at this juncture, is it possible that I need to do something slightly different that I have right now, just at the right moment in the world, I have a voice that speaks in another way. In other words, that my skill sets in fashion are more, are, are serve the world better through meditation, yeah? Because ultimately, they're both lines of intelligence that, are, that articulate a certain sense of style, a certain sense of showing up, a certain sense of making the world beautiful on a fundamental level. On a fundamental level, that making beauty in the world is, the, is that deep impulse, right? In other words, if we close our eyes, sorry, not so far with the technology. When we, when we close our eyes and we dance, right, or we kiss, yeah? or we sign our name, mm -hmm. if we think too much, we don't get it. We don't get it right. <laughs> yeah, it, the true. kiss becomes clumsy. The signature, we try too hard, and it's not bad, but it's not quite right. Even if we swallow, it requires a certain trusting and relaxing and letting go, just like the dance. If we try too hard, we don't get the rhythm. But if we just let go, it's right there. And so it's the same thing in making that decision. Am I on the right path 
or the wrong path. Neither path is, no path is wrong, right? Because all, path, all wrong paths are ultimately just uh, barriers and uh, speed bumps and cues for this greater path. Yeah, there is no wrong path. It's just like, how do I silence the mind? You don't. Mm -hmm. We do the opposite, you know? We let it in. So if we're on the wrong path, go as aggressively as possible on the wrong path, yeah? In other words, to find what is the, the, the right. In other words, to breathe all the way through it and engage fully in the thing that calls us the, the most, yeah? In other words, sure, sometimes we get to the foot of Mount Everest and we get up 10,000 feet and we say, you know what? I, 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 it's not that I'm afraid to go up here. It's not that I'm justifying going home. But I feel something deep inside that I need to be doing this other thing right now. And it's so important and it just hit me. And we only know that with our eyes closed when we feel it deep, 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 deep inside, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas when we're at the foot of Everest and we're part way up and we say, oh my God, I don't want to do this. I've got to go do something else. No, 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 no. Keep up the mouth, <laughs> right? Right? In other words, not fear, right. but just saying, is there something else calling me or is this the thing that's calling me? And sometimes it's as simple as just engaging more deeply and having a discipline to show up with it again and again and again and again and again. For you, you showed up and you gave your full self to this sense of making beauty in the world. And you said, ah, there's another way to make beauty in the world that I, I feel I'm, I will be in greater service to. Because ultimately, right, it's about being in service to something. If we really think about what draws us mm -hmm. as a gardener, as a painter, as a lover, even right it's not about getting it's always about being in service to even in a kiss right it's about being in service to the kiss in the dance it's about being in service to the music and that's how we in this little world our tiny little selves find joy and meaning is always by being in service to the thing i love it now tell me a little bit about happiness and joy you just mentioned the joy what is the difference between happiness and joy <laughs> <laughs> I, I suppose joy you know is just this expression of life just the blooming of the flower of of, mm -hmm. of really being in service mm -hmm. just that instant that moment right and happiness is just the awareness of that joy you know the joy is this being fully in service and and then the happiness is being aware, I'm in service, and this is beautiful. I love it. Two more questions, Sebastian. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. okay. First one. Um, how do you see the future of your own world? Of my own? World. The future of your own world. Mm -hmm. This is actually quite a long answer, but I'm going to try to truncate it. No, yeah, I mean... And the reason it's long is because if I look at what are the parts of that question, right? How do you, so who's you, mm -hmm. see the, you know, future of your world, right? Mm -hmm. And I think about what's that time frame? Are we talking about the little me in this life for the next month, year? 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever that is? Or are we looking transcendentally over thousands or millions of years? And who's the me that's doing the looking that, from that transcendent space or is it from this little space? So first from that transcendent space, there's this spectacular thing always occurring, right? That we, that we drop into. And how do I apply that for me in terms of leaning into what are the capacities that I have in this existence um, in service to this sort of becoming, in other words, the blossoming of some, some beautiful flower or plant or tree or sunrise or moonrise or star twinkling in the night. It's definitely for me in, turn, in as, as a communicator. It's as a storyteller, right? Uh, how do I see the coming weeks and months and years it's very clear for me as a director, as a, as a, as a writer, yeah. as a, someone who, uh, it's as, as, as a painter or as a pointer uh, at this beautiful extrapolation uh, of life. Yeah. As a musician, as someone bringing into uh, being 
uh, just the awareness that this spectacular thing is occurring uh, as a liberator to say, let's allow ourselves to be crucified so that we may be resurrected. Mm -hmm. That's my mission as a storyteller in books. That's my mission as a storyteller with movies. That's my mission as a storyteller with psychology and, and, and meditation. That they're all about crucifixion and resurrection. In other words, the in-breath and the out-breath. <sighs> Letting go to hold on. Being aware to the deepest possible capacity that we can. Stepping out of our own way. What does that look like in the coming weeks? Is there, I mean, the workload's heavy. It's a lot. Um, but it's, it's uh, the dedication and devotion to it. Yeah. So I'm, I want to make many movies. I want to write many books. But who knows? As the form changes, maybe that, those many books become one longer book. Yeah? Maybe those, uh, you know, the, the format of movies and media is changing rapidly. Yeah? Uh, so I don't want to be too bound uh, in my own head and too limited to my sense of exactly what that looks like. But at the same time right now, I wanna look at the window and say, okay, in the coming you know, 24 months or something like this, I'm looking at many films on many levels as a writer, producer, director on different movies in different capacities, right? Um, I'm working as an actor on a show, on a series, uh, and I'm in the process of, of uh, writing uh, my second book, yeah. And so I want to engage in that with my full attention and my full dedication and devotion. Uh, the movies that I'm looking at, many of them are my own uh, IP, intellectual property, that are uh, books or scripts that are in various stages of development. Some are other people's movies that I'll either produce or direct or produce and direct or write, produce and direct. Um, so there are a couple of films that interest me right now that are larger, more uh, sort of uh, studio films, bigger films. Um, dramas, uh, one is uh, uh, an epic, huge action drama, uh, but with very interesting aspects to it as well. Uh, and then other are very simple human stories you know, that I want to tell. I love it. I can't wait. I can't wait to see all your, um, all your projects. You know, I, I want, and, I, and I think also just to kind of ground that a little bit, when I think about closing the eyes and trusting, you know, I only arrived at this moment of having a certain dexterity as a director because of following my gut in the last 15 years. In other words, I've written, produced, and directed trailers, documentaries, teaser short films, and now feature films. I've, I've done movies from a helicopter, from a yacht, from a Zodiac, from underwater and car chases, um, just on sets, uh, making, allowing people to laugh and cry. In other words, done all these things that now put me in a position where I could uh, you know, I have the capacity or the basic the fundamental skill sets to direct a giant movie of any scope in any territory, yeah, of any kind of dynamic, you know, that I can run a movie set because of trusting those things earlier on that mm -hmm. maybe at some point seemed ridiculous. Yeah, you know, in other words, when I directed this one trailer years ago, you know, people, uh, some people were asking, well, listen, if we cut the budget on this thing or if we constrain things, you know, do you really need to shoot this shot from a helicopter? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I don't need to, but if we can do it, let's do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, do you really want to shoot this on a yacht? You know, that's so hard to shoot on a boat for many, many, many reasons, mm -hmm. you know, wind and light and, and insurance and you know, safety. There are many, many, many issues with being about, I said, yes, I want to do it because I knew it was challenging and it sounded like a good time, like a challenging, good time. <laughs> I, would, I would need to become better and more. And, and sure enough, I got, I, we did it. And now I have that skill set by trusting that challenge. In other words, by trusting what at one time for me was a Mount Everest is now for me a really good time, right? And so I'm always looking for that next Mount Everest. And so the things that interest me now, um, you know, as a film director are a, dy a range of different movies. Uh, and, you know, we can talk more about those at another time, but there are some spectacular stories. That I would amazing. love to, yes. Incredible. I would love to. Some of the most brilliant actors in the world that I'm collaborating with on these coming films and some of the most brilliant producers and writers, you know, and, and, uh, and individuals. You know. I love it. And I love so much your energy that you really can be such a such a good example for so many that when you just go on the mountain, just just run, just do it. Mm -hmm. So my last question is 
if you're going back to your younger Sebastian, what will be an one advice that you will tell to, to him, to you, to the little Sebastian after all this experience? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's always a great question. It's, um, and I think it's always in any way, in, in some ways it's always, it must be the same answer, which is to have faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that panic and concern and worry never help anything. If there's an earthquake, if you panic, I don't know if it doesn't think it helps anything. Yeah. If you're kissing and you panic, it doesn't help anything. If you're trying to save someone's life or give life to someone or having a baby, yeah, or painting a painting, uh, I don't think that panic and that restriction never helps. But faith and the difference between trust and hope and faith, trust and hope is wanting something to go a certain way and faith is not needing it to go any kind of way, but just knowing that it's going to go anyways. And that if I give myself to it, I'll go and give in the correct way. So it would be to, to just to say, to, to show, to demonstrate, which perhaps sometimes is not uh, effable. You know, it's, 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 it's not uh, sayable in words sometimes, right? Having faith. Because having faith requires closing our eyes and totally giving ourselves up to the process. So if I could speak to the younger me, it would be to say, to allow myself, to inspire myself, to let go and say, have faith, it's going to be beautiful. You might not like some of it, you're gonna love a lot of it, <laughs> but either way, I swear to you, it's going to be spectacular and ridiculous. <laughs> I love it. I love it and I, I love, I love, and I really hope it's just the beginning of all this spectacular experience that you had until now, Sebastian. And thank you so much for having time for us. And um, really, I really hope you will um, have a, give us a lot of um, luck as our first podcast um, that we will start with you now. So it was amazing. I really, I really, I really love it. Thank you so much for your time, Sebastian. You're a brilliant light. Thanks for all you're doing in the world. It's a pleasure and an honor to be, to be here with you. Thank you, Sebastian. Coming from you, it's a, it's, a huge, it's a huge compliment. Thank you, Sebastian. I think what you are doing, it's so necessary and so beautiful. I wish you all the best and good luck with all your future projects. That was the actor, director, author and integral artist Sebastian Siegel. For more inspiring interviews like Sebastian, hand it over on the Omnis Live podcast. I have so many more surprises coming soon. If you like it today's show, please share it with your friends, family or community. I'm Krina Okumus and you've been listening the Omnis Live podcast.